So, um, I'm going to go through the same kind of territory, but back out to the bigger picture, the context that uh, the last two uh, presentations have, have been in. Having been working on and around uh, this waterfront area for, well, I can count at least 20 years of various uh, things that have happened. Our site. So I'm here on behalf of, I mean, people talk about Craig Kerr putting the white caps because that's how, how the rail line thing uh, came about. The uh, management uh, vehicle that this is being done under is called Carrera Management, and you'll see. Uh, <coughs> So, 18 acres, downtown waterfront land with a long-term ground floor tenant, plus the landing, plus 320 Granville Street. The center of Vancouver, right here at its edge. So, if you do the general math, you get three FSR gross would be 3.5 million square feet, mostly gathered at the Western Hub. <coughs> da 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 da, off we go, how much, how high, whatever. Later is the time for, for numbers. This, this moment uh, today is about the poetry of opportunities and constraints, and most importantly, aspirations. So I want to frame the aspirational part with a quick spin through the history of the future of our lands. <laughs> now, the top in each of these things in purple is the planning question superimposed upon a view of the existing uh, Vancouver. So 1968, marathon development, 50 years ago, a vision of, guess what, approximately 3.5 million square feet on a waterfront freeway. And the only park built was Granville Square, becoming today's opportunity and constraint, and actually clarifying some of the conditions required in order to build over the tracks. Ironically, for the <coughs> Granville Square haters, functional needs are pointing towards extending Canada Place, but not as a freeway. 1979, Central Waterfront Official Development Plan. Now the C bus, which you can kind of find in there, and I won't try for pointers, was built in the mid 70s. Waterfront station, which is pretty run down, was renovated. And in the early 1980s, the old Pier BC became Canada Place, um, towards the bottom of this slide. So this was the period when Vancouver's population was declining, and planning was, was couched as fit rather than growth very different context to today. The linear development uh, was shown all the way to Main Street with little regard to the economics of building on the mush at the edge of the ocean. Skipping ahead to the 1990s, Central Waterfront Policy <coughs> Statement, uh, the, the port lands north of Waterfront Road being under the jurisdiction, basically federal jurisdiction, it was a, uh, a collaborative process rather than a city process. So this was in that the port was seeking a developer for an expanded convention center near um, east of Canada Place. And this led to the urban plan for the port's central waterfront lands north of the rail yards. So the port lands, which extends well out uh, into the water, was shown with approximately 3 million square feet north of rail yards. The urban form tapering down uh, from the downtown core in, in the west uh, down, down to the east. Now, the rail yards were tacitly assumed to be going away. They're kind of inconvenient, but the SkyTrain had been built and West Coast Express was on the way. One outcome around this process was that creating a real available beach became Crab Park. And interesting, the sea bus here is shown built over. Now, this is less than 20 years old. And note, the port's retaining a site right in front of Granville Square. Port side, approximately 94 to 99. The convention center expansion, which is illustrated here, was to be built over the water east of Canada Place with a casino and tall hotel at the Viaduct Junction. Granville Street was not extended in this scenario. But the Five Corners intersection at Cordova was already known to be a problem. The sea bus would have been relocated northeastwards with moving sidewalks. But anyway, various layers of obstacle and opposition, notably anti-casino uh, sentiment and the cost of development over deep water, killed the project. The key legacy was a viaduct by the way registered across the rail yards. Now in this period, Marathon, being CP Rail's real estate arm, 
separated waterfront station with its eastern parking lot from the remainder of the rail yards. By the early 2000s, the convention center had moved west of Canada Place to where it is now. And then in 2005, as part of the Whitecaps Waterfront Stadium, Greg Kerfoot bought the CP Yards, CP Rail here, yards from Maryland. So CP Rail as a tenant can continue rail operation, but the yards can be reconfigured for redevelopment, retaining most of the rail capacity. Now in terms of the stadium stuff itself, our primary focus was on site number two. So you're seeing three sequential operations. The one was the one that all the high-level review stuff was about on the principle of showing the city what would happen if we did it on our land only as opposed to partnership with the port. In the end, competing claim between the port and TransLink on the water channel between Canada Place and the Seabus shifted to number three as being the site for the rezoning application that died the day the city went on strike in the fall of 2007. This is not about the stadium, but about aspiration for urban life at the water's edge. Now, we call this the People Tower, because who can say no to the people? <laughs> the stadium was not about 30,000 people coming to 30 soccer and football games, but being an exciting hot spot that resonates in the daily pulse of the city. Simply put, it was a park amphitheater with a ring of food and beverage outlets around a 24-7 seawall with office, hotel, and assembly spaces with an unbeatable vibe. Starting from the assertion that soccer is a village, which is how the Whitecaps operate as an inclusive community, think of it like Seattle's Pike Place Market wrapping around David Lamb Park with all kinds of seating, sunbathing, and activity stages surrounded by the seawall and all with a magnificent view of the water in the mountains. So the People Tower itself, which is on the rail yards, was a complement, a vertical mix of interconnected functions, gathering together the density of the rail yards in a singular form of critical mass, unlike anything yet seen in Vancouver. Getting into the hub planning framework process of this uh, time period, we absorb the ambitious vision of a massively expanded transit hub, as you've seen presented, and the city's aspiration to bring Granville Street through to the water, what's on our neighbor's land, and hope that someone would find the value to pay for all of this. Very aware of how our land and best column locations were being claimed for the transit hub, our working assumption was that building height would be allowed to compensate for this. Now, we did much work on the infrastructure for the stadium, and this sensitizes us to the devils in the details of phasing and interconnectivity. The work set the stage for our current version of a range of public environments up and down, side to side, and connected in layers. But first, the Central Waterfront Hub Framework Plan. This is not the exact drawing we would have drawn. We're very wary of being boxed into third party agreements. But there is a fundamental, simple, and sound urban logic at work here a framework we're now starting to flesh out. So that brings us to today. What is to be the road? And what is pedestrian passage? And what is gathering place? What is to be covered? What seeks to attract sunshine? And what seeks to be a winter garden? There are many levels of debate to be had about moving the vision forward, and a few million square feet of successful development need to be encouraged here to provide the unique excitement of the centers of the city being at the edge, of making this place a fundamental workhorse at the heart of the region and a place of delight. Well-paying commerce is essential for this sustainable vitality, and this will also be one of the most inclusively accessible uh, environments in Metro Vancouver. So our planning is starting with the fundamentals of infrastructure, and we're connecting the dots. You see the three key control points, and assembling a ring of tall building forms, imagine them expanded like a series of Rubik's cubes, linked below grade, at grade, and possibly one or more levels above grade. And the early key question is what is to be placed at the point of compression, that is 555 West Cordova, that will make the best possible synergy with our bigger vision of the waterfront. So that is the context that we're now coming through 
to this consideration of the central waterfront. Time for a conversation. <laughs>